So this morning we're continuing on at this look uh, at covenant and kingdom. We've been on this for a number of weeks now and we'll continue as we focus on Jesus and the cross this morning. We've seen so far that it is about um, relationship and responsibility. God invites us into relationship with him through his covenant and then out of that relationship he's given us responsibilities. He's given us the ability to, to work with him and work alongside of him. It has to do with being and then doing out of our being. So we have all these word pairs that we've talked about. Covenant and kingdom, relationship and responsibility, being and doing. And this morning I want to add one more word pair to that. It's the words of uh, substitution and victory. And that really is the message of the cross this morning as we focus on Jesus and the cross. The cross is where Jesus made the way for us, where he took our place. The the fancy theological term for this is, is substitutionary atonement. And basically that means that the atonement is payment or reparation, and substitution, of course, is where he took our place. Someone takes our place. And so when we were in need... When we had sin in our lives, Jesus came and he substituted for us. He took our place and he paid the price for us. In Luke 22, verse 20, one of the gospel accounts uh, of the Last Supper, Jesus says, or it says this, After supper he took a cup of wine and said, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, or between God and his people, an agreement confirmed with my blood which is poured out as a sacrifice for you. So Jesus talks about how his blood is, is the sign of this new covenant, this new understanding, this, this fresh start in a relationship with God. Covenant is about unity. Covenant is God inviting us into a unified relationship with him. Covenant is, is as we've talked about in other contexts, is about two parties becoming one, two parties being joined together. So covenant is very much about unity. And so when Jesus comes along and he lays down his life to create this new covenant with us, he's inviting us to be united with him. He's inviting us to become one with him in that relationship. So that brings us to the passage we're looking at this morning out of 2 Corinthians. And this is how Paul could say in in 2 Corinthians 5, 4-15. Either way, God's love controls us. Since we believe that Christ died for all, we also believe that we have died to our old life. He died for everyone, so that those who receive his new life will no longer live for themselves. Instead, they will live for Christ, who died and was raised for them. He means that you and I, as we say yes to, to Jesus in this new covenant, in this, this invitation to a new relationship, because we're united with Christ, we're also united with Him in His death. And so we die to ourselves. We die to our old ways of living. We become one with Him. As Jesus is described as the Son of God, as we are united with him through Jesus, we also become children of God. We have a new relationship with God the Father. And it's it's like the relationship between a parent and a child. And so that new relationship gives us that new beginning, that fresh start. It's one of, of a new life and dying to the old life. When we understand this covenant from that perspective, everything changes. I mean, how could anything in the old life be the same? How could anything be like it was before? When we have been changed, when we've been entered into this, this new relationship, we've been given this, this new status as sons and daughters, as children of God. And when we're called to a life of, of radical discipleship, a, a very different kind of life, a very different kind of, of living than the way the world lives, it's radically different. Paul continues on, verse 16. So we have stopped evaluating others from a human point of view. At one time we thought Christ merely from a, thought of Christ merely from a human point of view. How differently we know him now. 
This means that anyone who belongs to Christ has become a new person. The old life is gone. A new one has begun. There might be times where we look at our lives and look at the world around us and we think, the the old is gone? I still see an awful lot of evidence of, of that old life in the world and even in myself. You look around, you see the same old problems, the same old challenges. It doesn't look like there's much evidence of that newness in our lives. And I love the way the New Living Translation puts this. That right at the very end of that, that section where it says, The new has begun. The new has begun. New life has begun. It's less an image of, of flipping on a light switch where the darkness is completely gone all at once and the light is all entirely there. It's more like the image of, you know, in the pre dawn hours. Where it's still dark, but you can start to hear the birds chirp. And you know the dawn is coming. You know day is on its way. Because you can hear the evidence of it. But you can't see very much. But you know the dawn will come and day is on its way. And we can start to see little evidences in ourselves of how that newness is beginning. It's not entirely there yet. It's a process. We're in a process of, of being changed. It doesn't happen like that. We're not completely transformed 100% in the blink of an eye, but we know that that change is coming as we continue to press in to God. We can know that, that what is true in heaven, what is spiritual truth, even though we might not see full evidence of that in our lives yet, we can know that it's coming. That it is being given to us. So that each day we can know we're loved. So that each day we can know that we are sons and daughters of God. We know that we can live in peace. Even though the old world is still surrounding us with the chaos and the pain and the difficulty. Let's keep going through 2 Corinthians 5 here. Looking at verse 18 now. And all this is a gift from God who brought us back to himself through Christ and has given us this task of reconciling people to him. So Jesus created this new covenant by being our substitute, by taking our place, by sacrificing himself, by paying the price that we should have paid in and of ourselves. And in doing that, he creates this this new relationship, this new covenant. And then that leads us to understand who we are. To understand that we are no longer about ourselves. That we are no longer have an identity that's rooted just in ourselves. That we have an identity now as children. As children of God. As children of the King. And because we are children, because our status has changed, we also have new responsibilities. God gives us the same job that He gave to Jesus. Jesus came so the world would be reconciled to him. That was Jesus' purpose. He came to pay that price. He came to to knock down the wall that was between God and people. And as we have joined with him in that, that covenant relationship, we also join with him in that covenant or that kingdom responsibility of inviting people to faith in him, inviting people to know that that freedom and that newness that we have. The story of covenant and kingdom ultimately is about God being committed to restoring his relationship with his creation. Just like that relationship was destroyed in the beginning because of humans and their sin, it's restored because of the sacrifice of a human being in the person of Jesus. Even though sin and and that, that break between God and creation was caused through human sin, it's restored also through A human sacrifice. As Jesus came, fully God, then took on a human nature upon himself and then laid that life down, sacrificed it, that relationship is restored. And for you and I, it means that God is is committing himself and has committed himself to, to our rescue, to our salvation. He paid the ultimate price. He did everything that he could so that we could be restored to that right relationship.
And he invites us to be his representatives, his agents of that good news. The good news of restoration. The good news of salvation. The good news of of right relationship between God and us through Jesus. We're to be agents of good news in a world that so desperately needs good news. So when there's times where we look at some of the awful things that are happening in the world around us or even in the people's lives that are around us and we're tempted to think, why isn't God doing something? Remember this. He is doing something. You're it. You are what He's doing. He has placed you in the relationships that you're in. He has placed you in in the community that you are in so that you can be His ambassador of good news. His ambassador bringing the good news of freedom and reconciliation to God. That's what verses 19 and 20 goes on to tell us. For God was in Christ reconciling the world to Himself, no longer counting people's sins against them, and He gave us this wonderful message of reconciliation. So, we are Christ's ambassadors. God is making his appeal through us. We speak for Christ when we plead, come back to God. And so we very quickly get from from covenant to to kingdom. We very quickly get from relationship to this responsibility. God has made us the good news. He's made us to be his ambassadors, his representatives. As you and I are in covenant together with God, we realize very quickly that with him as our father who is also the king, that he's entrusted to us this ministry, this ministry of reconciliation. He is all about wanting to reconcile people to himself. He's all about wanting to mend and fix the relationship that he has with people. And so as we get out of ourselves and realize that that our lives really aren't about ourselves, but we are to be about our father's business, then we realize that we're to be part of that, that work as well. He's given us that same work. And so this is something we've been saying from the very beginning, that, that covenant is the beginning, and then the kingdom pieces come out of that. Responsibility flows out of a relationship. That our doing flows out of our being. Out of our identity as children, of God the Father, who's also King, flows our job to represent God in a world, to be light in a world that needs it. To be the good news in the lives of people around us. And then in verse 21, Paul again summarizes what this good news message is. For God made Christ, who never sinned, to be the offering for our sin so that we could be made right with God through Christ. Jesus had no sin. Jesus, to put it in a more human kind of perspective, Jesus didn't have a disease. He didn't have the disease that we have. He had none of the symptoms. But God allowed him to get the disease. And it killed him because that's what disease does. But in his, in his blood... The antibodies against that were built up so that through his blood we can be saved. He took the disease of sin upon himself so that we could live. Became our substitute. The one who died on our behalf. And because of that, that covenant, that desire for God to reconcile the world to himself, Jesus became our champion in that way. In the Old Testament of the Bible, we see this idea depicted for us. And I think that God did this to prepare us for the reality that Jesus was going to do this work. Sometimes in the Old Testament, you would read where there's a battle going on, a war going on between two nations. There are times when two armies that were fairly evenly matched, instead of them fighting to the death each army, they would pick a champion from each side. And, and the idea of David and Goliath, the story of David and Goliath was... A very vivid example of this. The Philistines had this giant. And he was their champion. And so they stood him up before all the people of Israel. And they challenged Israel to send your champion to fight us. 
And then when those two champions fought, whoever was the winner of that was the winner of that, that battle. Instead of armies fighting against each other and hundreds or thousands of people being killed or, or injured, these two champions would go at it. And we know that David, with, um, with God behind him, became that champion. And that is a picture of the victory that Jesus won for us. Jesus became our champion. He became the one who represented us, who went ahead of us, and won that battle for us. Colossians 2, 3-15 to underlies that truth. You were dead because of your sins, and because your sinful nature was not yet cut away. Then God made you alive with Christ, for He forgave all our sins. He canceled the record of the charges against us and took it away by nailing it to the cross. In this way, he disarmed the spiritual rulers and authorities. He shamed them publicly by his victory over them on the cross. The early church leaders uh, had a way of putting it. And the way they put this this reality was that, that God tricked the devil. And actually in some of the early church readings you see that, that idea coming out very clearly of, this, of God tricking the devil, of setting him up in some ways. Some of the early church fathers would still use that, that language like Jesus was the bait that hooked the devil and defeated him. We see that same kind of idea if you're familiar with uh, C.S. Lewis and his uh, the Chronicles of Narnia. The, the picture of the white witch fighting Aslan and, and Aslan... Um, the, the white witch being kind of tricked in some ways into, into making Aslan's death come about. But she didn't read the fine print. She didn't know that one who sacrificed himself would be not only able to sacrifice or make that sacrifice for everybody else, but would come alive again. Jesus came as our substitute. Jesus came to pay the price for us. He did it because we couldn't. He did it because we weren't able to. We couldn't defeat sin. It's too big. We didn't have what it takes. But Jesus could, and he did. He died in our place so that we could enter into this this covenant, this relationship with him. And because of that, he invites us to this ministry of reconciliation, to be his ambassadors, to represent him wherever we go. Bringing light. Bringing good news. And so we have this continued idea of relationship and responsibility. Of being and doing. Of substitution and victory. The idea of covenant and kingdom. Let's pray. Jesus, thank you for your sacrifice. Thank you for caring about us so much that you made this sacrifice willingly. And it was out of your love that you did that. God, as we live in this world, help us to be people of good news. To be people of hope. Be people of peace. And people that, through our lives and through our words, direct people to the hope that we can have in you. In Jesus' name, amen.